Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello. I am delighted to be here today, and uh, ever since I first set my foot on MIT campus as an undergraduate student, I've been trying to be true to our motto, Mens et Manus, which highlights the need to cultivate both mind and hand to help others. And as a practicing ear and skull-based surgeon, the differential specific of my profession is surgery. So when we talk about workflow, it's split into three key components. Preoperative, which is focused on establishing a correct diagnosis. Intraoperative, which is focused on providing correct treatment. And postoperative, which deals with prognostication based on surgical outcomes. And as an AI pioneer and MIT professor Pete Solowitz said, it's very important for AI to fit into a workflow. And today, I will exclude areas such as payment processing and insurance customization and hospital flow optimization, where most of money can be made in the short time. But as a way of introduction, I share my fascination with hearing that is so beautifully described in Seth Horowitz's book, The Universal Sense how hearing shapes the mind. And sound is the fastest sensory input, and sound and vibration have permeated uh, all of evolution. And in fact, even the simplest of life forms, including bacteria, are sensitive to vibration. And hearing is special among the senses because sound can travel long distances. It can travel through any media, around obstacles at day and night. And even electromagnetic radiation that we are all bathed in is a form of vibration, and we can convert it into sound to study it. So today, we can indeed hear gravitational waves as they ripple through time-space. So from neuroanatomy, we know that the inner ear is a window into the brain. The hearing begins when sound vibrations set in motion the tympanic membrane, which in turn sets in motion the smallest bones in the body, in the middle ear, which in turn sets in motion fluids in the inner ear, where sensory cells are, known as hair cells, which leads to neurotransmitter release and excitation of the auditory nerve, which then transmits electrical signal up the auditory brainstem and midbrain all the way to the cortex. It turns out that the vast majority of hearing loss originates from the inner ear. And statistics around, about hearing loss are truly staggering, as summarized by the World Health Organization. Namely, nearly half a billion people are disabled by hearing loss across the world. This results in 750 billion of estimated economic loss annually. And things are not getting better, because it's estimated that over a billion young people are at risk for hearing loss, primarily due to recreational noise exposures. And it turns out that hearing loss affects 16% of the workforce. The number doubles by the retirement age, and affects three quarters of the octogenarians. So now going back to our workflow, let's talk about diagnosis first. The key diagnostic tool that we have at our disposal today is a hearing, aid, is a hearing test or an audiogram. And it depicts frequency on the horizontal axis and the degree of hearing loss on the vertical axis. So normal hearing looks like a straight line across. However, in age-related hearing loss, we see the classic downsloping pattern at mid to high frequencies. But audiograms are notoriously insensitive because, it turns out, you can have normal audiometric thresholds even if 80% of your cochlear neurons are gone. So that highlights the need for better diagnostic tests. 
And today, we do not know what's going on in any living human inner ear. And this slide illustrates why. This is a microcomputed tomography scan of a human temporal bone. And you can see the oracle. And this coil structure is the cochlea. It's small. It's encased in the densest bone in the body. And it's located deep in the base of the skull. So for that reason, what we do know about the cellular origins of hearing loss today in humans comes from studying autopsy specimens. And in that process, we extract the temporal bone from the skull. And then in a laborious process that takes a year, we decalcify it, embed it, section it, and stain it to generate slides that look like this. So this is a human cochlea in cross-section, which is embedded in blue-colored bone. And next to a penny, you can see that in cross-section, it's the size of Lincoln's upper face. So not even the entire face. It's just the upper face. And when we zoom in, we can appreciate that there are many different cell types in the inner ear. And they are beautifully arranged in precise spatial patterns. And loss or damage of any one of these cells can cause hearing loss. So today, we are unable to see this beautiful microanatomy in living humans. But what can we do? So this shows you state-of-the-art clinical imaging of the inner ear today. On the top, you see a computed tomography scan that outlines the bony uh, cochlea, the bony rim around it, and that's in white. And at the bottom, you see a magnetic resonance imaging where fluid-filled spaces are shown in white. And there are research tools that do provide higher resolution, but they're not clinically translatable because they require doses of radiation that would be unsafe. So in order to address this huge diagnostic bottleneck, we are pursuing optical tools because optics provides higher resolution. And to give you a feel for what we are dealing with, I'm showing you a surgical view of the right ear. So the patient is lying down with the head like this so that the ear is pointing up. And the drum is lifted up. And now we are looking at the bony rim of the cochlea. This is the basal turn of the cochlea. And you can see this bony ledge right here that partly obscures the round window membrane which is the only non-bony opening into the inner ear. So our vision is to develop a tool, a tiny tool, that could go through this natural opening and allow us to see the interior of the inner ear for the first time in living people. But this is not an easy task. And our inspiration comes from micro-optical coherence tomography, which was developed by our collaborator, Gary Tierney, an MIT alum who works at Massachusetts General Hospital. And we were inspired by micro OCT because there are already tools in clinical practice that are flexible and used to image other parts of the body, namely the cardiovascular and the gastrointestinal system. But of course, the probe that needs to be developed for the ear has a much harder task. It has to be much smaller and much more flexible. So the first step was to see whether by applying micro OCT to a guinea pig inner ear that was extracted from the animal but was otherwise three-dimensionally intact, and we made a little opening into the bone, whether we could see structures. And this is the work of a current graduate student, Jan Eyer, who is sitting in the audience. And indeed, we can see recognizable structures. We can see the basilar membrane here, and the sensory epithelium. And you see these two dark spaces. And now we'll take a fly through this particular space. But let's first look at a zoomed in view of this space. And now when we are flying through this space for several hundred microns, you'll be able to see and even count nerve fiber bundles that are traversing this space. And 
we can next be quantitative about it, because we are at MIT after all. Uh, and we can count the number of these nerve fiber bundles. And they are very important because they supply outer hair cells and affect their motility. And it's really astounding that these cells move at audio frequencies. And they affect their motility and function to extend the dynamic range of hearing and protect us from noise trauma. So the next step then was to expose mice to very loud noise levels, the equivalent of using uh, very loud power tools for a couple of hours unprotected. And when we look at that inner ear at the bottom, you see that the organ of cordy, the vibrating organ of cordy, is completely gone. It's wiped out. That stands in sharp contrast with the normal organ of cordy on the top, where you can see different cell types, and they are labeled in different colors. So these data have motivated us to now develop a tiny probe that's 400 microns in diameter and flexible and could be navigated into the inner ear to acquire new data and inform us about the cellular origins of human deafness to guide personalized therapies. And these are big data. The files that we are talking about are huge, and this is where AI will help us, not only in terms of dealing with these data, but also extracting the most meaningful features that are most predictive. But how will we know we are correct? We need a different technique to validate our findings. And I've told you that using standard histology takes a year. That's not practical. So we found uh, an alternative, which is synchrotron radiation phase contrast imaging that provides unprecedented resolution of a three-dimensionally intact human cochlea. So here you can see, encased in bone, a beautifully spiraling organ with nicely arranged rows of cells. And now we can take a fly through this space and we can start to appreciate cells in ways that were unthinkable before. So with this preoperative focus on establishing better diagnosis, let's move on to therapy. Today, when it comes to therapies for hearing loss, we are pretty much limited to hearing aids and cochlear implants which are devices that electrically stimulate the auditory nerve and bypass cells that are uh, not working. And th now there is an emerging field of biological therapeutics that's incredibly exciting and fascinating and includes gene therapy, which we are pursuing, and other small molecules. But when it comes to hearing aids, there is a huge stigma associated with hearing loss. It's typically associated with old age, and with cognitive decline. And this stands in sharp contrast with wearing glasses, which is considered a sign of intellect and even worn by people who don't need them as a fashion statement. <laughs> However, things are changing with the advent of hearables. And here, hearables are defined as wearables that fit in or around an ear and have a wireless link. And they're reasonable, reasonably non-intrusive because there is a huge experience with hearing aids over decades. And they can not only provide audio streaming, but can provide additional functionalities. And conveniently, the ear is located to so many things that matter. So that biometric data that have been collected from hearables include not only vital signs that we have heard about today, including blood pressure and temperature and pulse, but also electroencephalograms and um, electrocardiograms. And the idea is that these data could be combined to infer emotional and physiologic and cognitive status of the user, as we have heard earlier today. In addition, these hearables can monitor and catalog the auditory scene to allow us to hear better, so to provide listening assistance, and also to provide protection. And this is very important not only for personal counseling, but also for public education, for industry and military alike. And a very exciting application that's 
receiving lots of media attention recently is real-time language translation. So by virtue of being worn a lot, these data, these hearables will be generating big data that may be of medical importance. So now I've talked about hearables, which right now we define as devices that are worn externally, but in collaboration with Ananta Chandrakasan, we are also working on devices that would be fully implantable. And we have developed, uh, we have demonstrated the feasibility of energy extraction from the biological battery in the inner ear, and we have used this energy to power a radio transmitter while sensing the inner ear environment. And in similar ways, we can sense its, its nearby structures, including the brain. So going back to the workflow that I began with, how can AI help surgeons? It can help us both in physical and information realm, and I've given you a couple of examples uh, about that. And it can help in three major ways. It can amplify our abilities through image analysis and more refined pathologic interpretations. Secondly, it can help us through novel interfaces. For example, I could use voice or gesture to project relevant things on the screen in front of me or on smart glasses that I may be wearing in the operating room. And thirdly, it can embody physical capabilities that stretch our abilities beyond what any one of us can do today. And this is to enhance precision and eliminate tremor and jitter. And as any profession, we have our bags of tricks. So we are trained how to hold our hands and instruments to minimize issues, however, they do exist. And in fact, when performing stapedectomy surgery, we are already pushing the limits of what's humanely possible. Because a mere 100 microns could mean a difference between an excellent hearing outcome and deafness. And this is where AI could help. So AI indeed has tremendous potential in surgery on all three parts of the workflow that we have discussed. Preoperatively, it could allow us to integrate data from many sources. I've given you examples of audiograms and imaging data where uh, we are talking about uh, data from any given sample taking up nearly 200 gigabytes of um, memory. We have also heard about genetic data and blood work data and personalized data from medical records. This information could be used to catch mistakes and could also be helpful in handling rare conditions. And I work in a tertiary referral center where we see lots of things that are otherwise considered rare. So they're not that rare after all. Intraoperatively, it could help us in many ways. It could help us with 3D printing of prosthesis. It could help us with image-guided surgical navigation so that we can see through bone, for example, when operating on the skull base. It could help us with micro and nano robots that could navigate these tiny confined spaces that we are talking about. And importantly, we are an educational institution, so it could help us with education and evaluation of not only our trainees, but ourselves. Because as the Latin saying goes, ars longa vita brevis. And postoperatively, it could help us with personalized adjustments, which mean, may mean tweaking of a cochlear implant or a, or a hearing aid or adjustments in medications or gene therapies that we are working on through data fusion. But now, if we look at this diagram of a hype cycle, You'll notice that lots of emerging technologies that we are discussing today are at the peak of that cycle, which means that inevitably we are headed for the trough of disillusionment. And indeed, when talking about the application of AI to surgery, we have to be um, we have to tamper our expectations because we are in the trenches of providing health care. So in addition for constraints when it comes to ear surgery, such as the issue of dealing with deep fields and confined tiny spaces, a more universal concern among all of 
medical practitioners is the need for causal inference and accountability of algorithms. Because medicine and surgery are some of the most regulated professions, and it's for a reason. We are dealing with human lives. So a regulatory body could raise a question. Why risk an incorrect computer decision harming a patient when no one would be able to explain how the computer made a wrong decision or how to prevent a repeat? And I know that this is a very active area of research in AI and that there are widely agreed methods that are considered explainable and widely agreed methods that are considered opaque. And then there is this emerging field of trying to borrow from the first group to approximate locally predictions from the second group when needed. And today, the way we deal with this in surgery is through morbidity and mortality rounds. And these are somber events in which we discuss in great detail the complications that occurred over the previous months. And through very detailed analysis, this allows us to learn and to prevent the same mistake uh, and its repeat in the future. And that's how we transfer our knowledge. So what are our future options? Basically, we have two. One, we could disregard AI altogether. Because according to a relatively recent study at Oxford and NPR, surgeons have 0.4% chance of being replaced by automation. <laughs> <laughs> However, our alternative is to embrace and advance AI, and this is a much more likely scenario because surgeons in general have been at the forefront of embracing technology. And indeed, it was only three years after Edison patented the incandescent light that a Scottish surgeon included a miniature bulb into his endoscope. So indeed, there is a huge need for AI in surgery, and it can help us on at least two fronts. It can help us with this huge and ever-growing data sets that we are dealing with, and secondly, it can help us formulate personalized surgery, where we are using this universe of available data and applying it and customizing it for a specific patient. And that's indeed the essence of precision healthcare. With that, I would like to thank people in my lab and my many collaborators across the globe and the funding agencies who have supported us. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, and for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.